We're going to be talking about myomectomy today in another consult with Dr. Olga Valieva. Yay. We'll go over what is myomectomy. We'll talk about the different approaches because there are a few. Who is it for? Risks and benefits of the uh, surgery. And we'll even talk about pregnancy implications to follow. All right. Hello and welcome back to the New School OBGYN podcast, a podcast in women's health, but for everyone. Our goal is to promote good and reliable knowledge because the source of information matters. My name is Eric Schmidt. I'm a board certified OBGYN. And today I have with me yet another board certified OBGYN, Dr. Olga Valieva. Hi, Please friends. <laughs> cut you off. Please please consider downloading and following along. We're on all the major podcast hosts and check us out on YouTube for the video podcast. All right. So myomectomy, let's talk about that a bunch. Olga and I do this procedure on occasion. Um, Probably a little more than that actually, but um, I think I do it more than you do it. Oh, do you? Mm. Because you don't like We'll pull the numbers on that since we're a (laughs) numbers podcast. (laughs) So we'll go over some quick terminology and anatomy review. Olga, explain to me as if I were your patient, what a myomectomy uh, yes. Eric, I'm on vacation. I don't want to work today. You are on vacation. Okay. You're dedicated. Um, <laughs> my mectomy is essentially removing the fibroid from uterus, whether it be one or 10, depending on how many you have. It's just surgical excision of the fibroid. Yeah. Um, we've talked before about fibroids. They are typically benign, really rare for them to be cancerous, but um, they can cause a lot of pain, bleeding for women, um, patients, and a lot of you know, pressure symptoms as well. So um, one of the ways that we manage them or treat them is by surgical excision of just the fibroids themselves. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and maybe we can pull a surgical video to put in the YouTube video for this too. Um, but, you know, myomectomies can be done in a few ways. Uh, we had a hysteroscopy podcast before, which uh, the fibroids, depending on where they are, mm-hmm. can be removed through hysteroscopy, which is nice. That's a quick, easy procedure. It's not quick. It, Quicker. Well, fibroids are a little more dense. Yeah. Then when you're doing hysteroscopy, those mm-hmm. polyps are nice because they just come out so easily. Um, but we're talking about uh, fibroids and uh, we'll pull up some images. Again, submucosal, if you look at the uterus and it has this balloon pear shape, um, submucosal is most towards the inside, the middle where the bleeding comes from. And so, um, or a pregnancy would be if a pregnancy was there, but like the in the, with that hysteroscopic mm-hmm. removal, that option is a uh, very nice, quick, easy procedure. Listen to our hysteroscopy podcast. The majority of this podcast, we're going to be talking about laparoscopic and the robotic and also potentially the open uh, myomectomy for the fibroids that aren't in that middle of the uterus. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, Olga, tell us a little bit about the laparoscopic approach because um, you can have it with or without robotics. Sure, um, yeah. Um, painful. Um, So with laparoscopic approach, just with any other laparoscopy, we make several small incisions. I typically only do four. Do you do four? Usually, yeah. Usually four, yeah. Depending on, again, you know, patients. Sometimes five. You know, these are like less than a centimeter little. Oh, those are so annoying. um, Incisions. Um, Yeah. So they're teeny tiny incisions. So we put all of our instruments through the small incisions. We make a cut over the uterus and scoop out all of the fibroids, put them into, uh, depending on, you know, different providers technique, we have, um, a more sleeting bag, essentially something we put inside and put the fibroids into it and then cut them into small pieces to make them come out of smaller incisions. Um, and then we close the holes and we go home. Yeah. Yeah, in these fibroid surgeries, you know, mm-hmm. it can be a little more difficult. Um, sure. And so when you're, we're talking about laparoscopic through the tiny incisions, um, you have to, to close those. Well, and, and then you're talking about, you know, you have to cut them out of the uterus. Mm-hmm. Then you have to close that close the, defect yeah. that's in the uterus now. And suturing laparoscopically is a very skilled technique. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say I suck at it. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> but now we have the options such as robotic mm-hmm. assisted, um, and which makes suturing um, laparoscopically much easier. Mm-hmm. Um, but just allows for a lot more dexterity internally. So I don't think I've done a straight laparoscopic myomectomy probably since residency. And that was pain and suffering. So I just, I do them all exclusively. Yeah, you kind of need a good, you know, really well oiled you know, mm-hmm. machine usually, or it's it, you know, um, good assistance, yeah. um, things like that. So, um, but you know, cause traditionally this procedure was done through a larger cut incision, mm-hmm. which was like an incision, um, that someone would get during a C-section or maybe mm-hmm. even an up and down incision that goes from the pubic hair up to the belly button or higher. Or higher yeah. Um, because unfortunately sometimes these fibroids can grow quite mm-hmm. big 
And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, and, and the decision to head to myomectomy, we talked a little bit about the procedure itself there. Um, just now, go ahead. I was going to ask, how do you decide when to do an open versus robotic? It's a good question. Um, some people, you know, if you're not at a, a, a center where they're take care of, you know, complicated surgeries regularly, mm -hmm. um, and don't do a lot of laparoscopy, you know, probably they're going to do an open mm -hmm. no matter the size really. Um, and so, you know, being with a provider surgeon that, you know, does these regularly and, and can do it laparoscopically, um, you know, not all your areas will have one, but it is, you know, you can hopefully find a place where they specialize more in it. Mm -hmm. Um, to do laparoscopic surgery, you need to have a little more room in the abdomen to operate your small little instruments that go in. Um, because if the uterus is, you know, quite large and they mm -hmm. can be like third trimester or bigger large, um, that really doesn't leave any space within the mm -hmm. abdomen to mm -hmm. put your little trocars to do the surgery. It's just like if someone's in the third trimester and let's say they have, uh, uh, their appendix burst, sure. um, um, then, you know, the surgery, you know, traditionally you could do it laparoscopically, mm -hmm. but often you have to do the, yeah. the larger cut incision for that because you just don't have the room. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, um, there is a, there is a size and that size matters between each surgeon, what they're comfortable yeah. with, uh, okay. proceeding and the number of fibroids and too. The number, and the patient as well. Some people have, even if they have the say 25 centimeter fibroid, but they have a longer torso and you have more room to put your instruments versus somebody who has a shorter torso and you just don't have any room to manipulate anything internally. So... Yeah, yeah, so it's a joint decision between you and your surgeon mm -hmm. on uh, the best route for you. Um, but likely you're doing this surgery because there's a reason. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, go, go over what some of these reasons why someone, you know, will choose myomectomy. We'll go over some of the options that compete with in our decisions, like, would, you know, myomectomy versus these other options. So mm -hmm. um, go ahead. We'll talk about um, the symptoms, the symptoms why someone would choose a myomectomy. Oh, we're doing that now? Yeah, okay. I'll do the patient scenario okay, after. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. So um, if typically we, if the fibroids are not symptomatic, then we just kind of say, let's just leave it alone, right? It right. might get to a point that it gets really big or if it already gets too big, even if patients aren't having symptoms, it might be time to intervene. But typically uh, patients will report symptoms of heavy bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding or prolonged bleeding for that matter, or pain slash bulk, uh, meaning you feel like there's a bowling ball sitting in your pelvis, you're uncomfortable, you're having pain with intercourse, you're just having pain on a regular basis, you have constipation, you know, you go into the bathroom every five minutes, those would be what we call bulk symptoms. Yeah. And sometimes women may not have any of those symptoms, but they have difficulty with conception, right? Because they have so many fibroids that there's just no normal territory, yeah. if you will, for yeah. the pregnancy to implant into. And this is really for those um, uteruses that are super distorted. Having one fibroid may not necessarily impact your fertility, but if you have, I don't know, 20 of them, <laughs> and you have yeah. no normal lining to your uterus, then that would be a time potentially to intervene. Um, caveat to that, it may not necessarily result in a pregnancy if we do a myomectomy, but we can yeah. at least try to do the best that we can. And Infertility you know, is yeah. so multifactorial, a lot mm -hmm. of factors that go into it. But if someone has... 15 fibroids mm -hmm. in their uterus um, and a, not a normal cavity, mm -hmm. you'd have to think that that would be the yeah. kind of the, um, the main suspect. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it also comes up, well, why not just do a hysterectomy, right? I mean, yes, yeah. we could definitely always do a hysterectomy, but some patients feel strongly about their desire to keep a uterus, whether it be cultural, personal, whatever. I mean, yeah. it is... Uh, it's an organ of the body. And yeah. so we want to do what we can sure. to like not have to do something, but mm -hmm. often it's driven by symptoms. That's not, that's also why mm -hmm. like somebody, you know, we do a, they're getting a CT scan because mm -hmm. they have whatever the reason is, they incidentally find a five centimeter fibroid in the mm -hmm. uterus. It's not like you need to go, oh my gosh, I need to go talk about how to get this removed. Mm -hmm. not, if you're having symptoms, you, you may not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's just weird for a lot of patients to think, oh, I have something sitting there. I need to get it removed. Right. But um, once we kind of counsel and talk, you know, how common this is, mm -hmm. maybe watch it for a while with repeat imaging, you know, might See not even do to, anything. Yeah. It might even shrink as someone gets older. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, um, some, some of those considerations about myomectomy. Again, it's a fertility sparing option and a uterus sparing option um, when it comes to treating uterine fibroids. 
Um, it has some competitors, which is good. Mm -hmm. Um, because myomectomy, it's a fairly big surgery, even if we do it laparoscopically and minimally mm-hmm. invasive and minimally invasively. We we talk about the length of the procedure, you know, how long it takes us to complete it can be three, sometimes four hours if it's a really difficult case. Um, and so there are some competitors out there to treat, um, you know, fertility sparing, or I shouldn't say that, uterus, uterus sparing, sparing yeah. options. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll give you the the floor for talking about uterine artery embolization then yeah. i'll give my input because i always have input regarding this one i do too <laughs> yeah uh when you were saying that it takes a long time i was just remembering one of my last myomectomies yeah i feel like i did nothing we were in there for like three hours and i want to say i took like... out like 15 or 17 fibroids and there was still so many i'm like we have to cut our losses at a certain point <laughs> you try to get yeah. what is you know what's like if, if it's for some... bleeding or if it's yeah. bulk you try to get out what you, you know, what are the main causes mm-hmm. and, but there's a point, yeah, you're right. Um, where it's kind of like just chiseling away and eventually mm-hmm. you see the progress, but, um, it can be pretty daunting. Yeah. yeah. At that point it was just like length of surgery and bleeding. Like, right. Cause yeah. Mm-hmm. Anywho, sorry, I digress. So uterine um, artery embolization, um, this is a procedure that we don't actually do. It's something that is done by radiology. Um, it is a procedure where we essentially, gosh, for lack of a better word, essentially strangulate the uterus, right? We cut off majority. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> can we cut off the blood supply? So we it just cut off the blood slowly supply to the uterus. passes. So, yes. <laughs> just a euphemism, Mary. Yes. Um, so what the radiologists typically do is we um, we do an MRI and we map out what the blood vessels or where the blood vessels are leading to the uterus and specifically the fibroids. And then they put catheters through the femoral veins, which are the major veins in the leg, um, and kind of sneak it up towards the uterine um, vessels and arteries mm-hmm. and put a plug or a dam, depending on, you know, there's different types of these. And Yes, they slowly cut away the blood supply to the uterus and um, fibroids really need that blood supply to grow. So when you take away essentially their source of nutrition, their food, they're going to shrivel up and not not, not die, a different word, just shrink. Um, It is a option, an option to help shrink the fibroids. They're still going to be there. They're not going away. They're just getting smaller. And typically we expect about 30, 40% shrinkage of the fibroids. It's not going to be 95%, but it may be enough to either A, decrease bleeding for a patient or B, decrease their bulk symptoms or both, right? It does take time. Uh, We don't expect the full shrinkage. Is that a word? (laughs) It's used often in different uh, lights, but yes. The full... uh, What's what's another word? <laughs> Shrinkage um, to happen. Degenerate. For, degeneration, sure. Yeah. For about three to six months, it just depends on how many fibroids, what their shape and size is. Um, and during that time, you know, patients can have, you know, discomfort, cramping, low grade fevers, occasional visits to the hospital for pain. Um, I'm not going to lie. I don't have a lot of people take me up on this one, but it is something that I talk about every yeah. visit. But yeah, you're very thorough. I mean, you have to be. Yeah, that's why we have you here. Um, So I can talk about shrinkage. (laughs) (laughs) That's what happens when we're on vacation. (laughs) Uh, She's on vacation. She's doing this on our spare time, everybody. Um, Isn't it always on my spare time? (laughs) Yes, it is. Um, So yeah, uterine artery embolization. I think the for sure, speaking to some of the interventional radiologists, mm-hmm. they really kind of have a preference on, well, they kind of like it if it's just one fibroid mm-hmm. and one fibroid that's not too massive. Yeah. Um, but so it's probably like for these fibroid sizes, like four to five to sure. seven at the most. Um, I've had some patients have some pretty bad experiences with it yeah. as that fibroid slowly gets kind of yeah. degenerated. Yeah. And, um, and so personally, you know, there are a lot of people that swear by it, um, you know, but honestly, it's, I've, I've for sure patients that haven't had the best experience. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, once we explain it, the procedure in an unbiased way, mm-hmm. uh, really don't choose it. Yeah. And they still need to have a consultation with a radiologist as well. So sometimes the radiologist will map out their uterus and say like, mm, not the best candidate and yeah. it is what it is. So it's, it's, you know, give it a shot. It might work. It, well, yeah. Um, and the thing too, is if somebody's doing all of this mm-hmm. and really, hopes for pregnancy in their future, it's not necessarily, um, you know, it, myomectomy is kind of proven track record with mm-hmm. pregnancy safety going forward. There are risks that we'll talk about, but um, it's pretty well studied. Mm-hmm. Um, uterine artery embolization doesn't have that necessarily um, as far as, yeah, you potentially could get pregnant, but it's kind of unknown how much yeah. that uterus is going to be damaged by that 
uh, inflammatory degeneration mm-hmm. um, that or goes on. Just the lack of blood supply too. So we just right. we just don't know. So it's not something that we'd recommend to say right. like so. a 25 year old, right? And then, yeah, moving on to the other competitor, which would be uh, radiofrequency ablation or laparoscopic radiofrequency mm-hmm. ablation. There is hysteroscopic approach, um, but has, uh, the laparoscopic radiofrequency ablation is when we poke that little probe into the fibroid laparoscopically and it burns it from the inside, mm-hmm. kind of like an in- instantaneous um, um, degeneration mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. Um, inactivation of the fibroid. Kind of a newer treatment um, over the last 10 years or so. And so, um, again, one of the, not the, it's just not been around long enough to have mm-hmm. the proven track record for safety in pregnancy. So while people have gone on to have pregnancies mm-hmm. after this procedure, um, it still fa- falls under the category yeah. of we just don't completely understand how that is affects the uterus, the uterus yeah. muscle going forward. Yeah, because we assume that we're only targeting the fibroid, right? We just don't know if we're going to damage it. But um, at AGL, I remember they were talking about it quite a bit and the numbers yeah, don't seem to... one of their to, laparoscopic yeah. conferences that we went to this past year. They don't seem to... They don't Again, they don't have a lot of pregnancies, but the few patients that went rogue and did get pregnant, <laughs> um, their outcomes Synced. are about the same as, you know, pre-ablative. Yeah. Yeah. But so it's, it's just promising, it's it, but it falls robust, under yeah. the, uh, the realm of unknown at this time. Right. So hopefully yeah. with some time we can get some more sure. clarity and more confidence with that yeah. going forward. Yeah. And uh, we've recently gotten the laparoscopic one at our hospital. We don't mm-hmm. have the hysteroscopic one, but it's, you know, it's promising. Only so one new toy option. at a time, they say, it, they tell us. So <laughs> shoot. Can't be left to our own devices. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And of course, you know, it's not a fertility sparing option. It's not a uterus sparing option, but hysterectomy would be the you mm-hmm. know definitive treatment of uterine fibroids because as long, you know, all of these treatments that we just mentioned, myomectomy, UAE, uter- mm-hmm. rate of frequency ablation of the fibroids, as long as somebody still has their uterus, you there's unfortunately a, still a chance that you can get fibroids in the yeah. future. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we talked about all these, we talked about the procedure of the myomectomy, um, and, you know, we'll go into some things, um, other things to consider. Um, you know, I, I really like myomectomy. We're going back to myomectomy now. I really like it because for the bulk symptoms, mm-hmm. like if somebody's mm-hmm. like, that has fibroids that are just pushing on things, causing symptoms, it's like their third trimester pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're going to probably significantly improve those symptoms with just removing the fibroids in a mm-hmm. myomectomy. But especially if somebody's like in their mid forties where bleeding abnormalities are becoming more common, someone's perimenopausal range, um, and, and they so they they're having bleeding irregularities, kind of a patient scenario here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's forty five year old coming in because their bleeding's irregular. We get an ultrasound, we find there's fibroids. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, let's so say five centimeter fibroids, a couple of them. Yeah. Um, can I blame? hundred percent that that's the problem for their bleeding. Mm -hmm. No. Um, and so if we go through, um, the counseling session and we're talking to the patient, it's like, okay, um, you know, do, if we remove the fibroids, it might not fix your bleeding problem. Mm -hmm. And I'd hate to do that big surgery on you and not fix the issue. So I don't love it for situations like that, but my actually definitely works for Mm -hmm. a lot of people. Yeah. I would agree. I mean, I, I've had situations where, you know, they have a three, four centimeter fibroid and they're like, no, it's the cause, it's the cause. And then right. it's it's a lot, it's expectations, right? Setting right. those expectations for the patients, but, you know. But that's where something like the rate of frequency ablation mm-hmm. might go come in well because mm-hmm. you can a little less invasively, quicker recovery, mm-hmm. shorter surgery, hopefully treat that fibroid. Yeah. Um, no, but I agree. And oftentimes patients will not even think that it's related to fibroids. They'll have like back pain or constipation issues. And they're like, well, I had no idea it was a fibroid and they don't even, or it's, they've just gotten so used to the symptoms as the fibroid goes over time that they just don't even realize that it's the fibroids, but they tend to have the most benefit. Yeah. So, I mean, we kind of just as, you know, put things off. Oh, just my back hurts. I'm just getting older. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so yeah, but, um, let's talk about this in pregnancy. Yeah. Um, so if, so, I'm just interested on in your opinion on this, mm-hmm. but if you have a patient that's like, I want to get pregnant in about mm-hmm. five years and they have this big fibroid mm-hmm. and they want it removed, um, let's say they have a 10 centimeter fibroid, sure. having some minimal to no symptoms, mm-hmm. no, no bleeding symptoms, no pain symptoms. Would, how do you think you'd talk to that patient about like, like, I don't want my pregnancy for five Ooh. years. Cause I, I know there's some differences in opinions. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think 
I, it, it ultimately depends on, again, the symptoms versus no symptoms. Um, the one thing I was talking about is I don't know how long it's taken this fibroid to grow. It could have taken 10 years yeah. to grow. It could have grown over the last six months, right? So right. I think in a completely asymptomatic patient, it would be, you know, we could repeat the ultrasound in three to six or six months to a year and see like, hey, has it grown much? If mm -hmm. it's growing a lot, then maybe let's move on it because... Right, right, right. Five years down the road, it might turn into well, an abdominal myomectomy versus laparoscopic, right? So, I mean, I mean, no, is it going to prevent new ones from growing? No, but it might fix, right. it'll fix this right. one, right? And then maybe we can talk about, you know, yeah. OCPs it, or other options to help yeah, and again, slow and, down growth of new ones, but it just depends on. Yeah. And just to emphasize a point, this patient wants mm -hmm. pregnancy. And so we're not necessarily considering the uterine artery embolization or the right. radiofrequency ablation yeah. for this patient. But just as you just said, that if we're like, okay, let's do surgery, we found mm -hmm. a fibroid, let's let's get it. Mm -mm. Um, uh, you know, we remove that fibroid, and the patient tries for pregnancy in yeah. five years, they get an ultrasound. Oh my gosh, they have another <laughs> right, one. Right. Um, so, um, whereas if you do that surgery a little bit closer to mm -hmm. their desire for pregnancy time, if they, that's what they want, then hopefully you avoid right. a second avoid, surgery. Right. Right. Again, it depends on if it's growing or not. Right. Because if it's stable, watch it. Right? right. And then do it closer to conception, so you're not having to worry about a recurrence. A lot of things that go through our mind when we mm -hmm. um, are seeing patients, and not ever, not everyone, or not every situation is the same. So yeah. we like to approach it. Yeah. And then there are patients that are like, I don't care. I don't want it in my body. That's that's cool, you know. Right. Body. Yeah, I understand it. If you have a cantaloupe mm -hmm. sitting there, um, you know, I, I wouldn't want that either. I think but, I'd name mine if I had one. Yeah. Boy or girl? <laughs> I don't know. Well, so it's it a doesn't have to be. It comes out of the uterus. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> All right. So, so other long? pregnancy considerations. Oh, yeah. How long do you wait after? Depends how bad it is. Like how many incisions you made? Um, sorry. What was what the question? What do you mean? How? how long do I wait for what? I pregnancy, sorry. How long do you wait for pregnancy? Yeah. <laughs> depends on what it is. Um, depends how bad the myomectomy sure. was. If it was a pretty simple, not too deep into the muscle, mm -hmm. three months. Yeah. Um, if it's a really, you know, multiple incision deep into the muscle, mm -hmm. um, probably six. Yeah. Yeah. Same? Yeah. Yeah. I probably err more on the six months just for I, I think it's just my paranoia. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm talking, I'll say three months because definitely for this, unless somebody's, again, all factors considered, every patient's different. If somebody's on a tighter schedule, mm -hmm. could consider options, but might talk to that patient yeah. about more leaning towards what we'll talk about next is... Um, have you seen any head to head about three versus six months? Because I haven't seen that as far no, as I think outcomes, it's because it's just depend like expert opinion, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so um, if a person is a little, has an expedited timeline and they don't mm -hmm. want to wait that time, they'll say they accidentally get pregnant. Um, you know, maybe we'll talk about C-section for their delivery mm -hmm. um, more because um, if somebody is now pregnant, mm -hmm. congratulations, uh, after your fiber, if, after your myomectomy, um, and now you have a scar in your uterus though. Um, just like if somebody had a C-section in their mm -hmm. first pregnancy, now they're pregnant again, they have a scar in their uterus. Mm -hmm. And we know that that can be a uh, potential rare, but a uh, dangerous scenario. Um, so that scar um, isn't as strong or stretchy as the normal tissue. Mm -hmm. So labor is a stressful time. Um, and so during labor, that stress can start to tear that, mm -hmm. that old scar. Um, and it's called a uterine rupture and can be quite an emergency, mm -hmm. uh, both um, threatening for mom and baby. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's why for a lot of these patients who have especially deeper fibroids in their muscle, for sure we're talking about hysterectomy. No, <laughs> no Eric. Oh no, gosh, I just, I'm a bad, bad. <laughs> bad, doctor, um, bad doctor. We're talking about cesarean, yeah. um, uh, C-section delivery, mm -hmm. cesarean birth, um, as was just changed as the politically correct way I to phrase say it. I that was a 2021 article. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, we're behind. We're within. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so if somebody has a scar, especially in the thicker muscle of the uterus, mm -hmm. um, that, that chance of uterine rupture kind of increases by like five to six fold mm -hmm. um, over like just a history of a normal C-section. Yeah. Um, and to clarify for those of you that may not necessarily know the nitty gritty of C-sections, when we make that typical C-section, the scar is over an area that doesn't have a lot of thick musculature. Mm -hmm. And usually when we do myomectomies, for the most part, they're over a really muscular part and that's the contractile part of the uterus. Um, so just the stress of the contraction itself can potentially cause, a, you know, 
it's such a dramatic word, it an is. opening in the scar, um, and which is why, depending on like Eric was saying, how deep we go is when we recommend a C-section. Sometimes a C-section, we do it at 37 weeks. Sometimes we do it at 39. It just really depends on the circumstance and how uh, damaged the uterus is, yeah. scarred the uterus yeah. is. Yeah. It's pretty rare that I yeah. have a patient and I'm counseling them on this and that they this is like a point of mm-hmm. concern because they've just yeah. been suffering with their fibroids. Sure. And- They've been suffering trying to, you know, with infertility potentially. Mm -hmm. And so they're, um, this is a little bit more of an afterthought, um, but obviously it's something that's good to talk about beforehand. And, and often what we, like I tell my patients, I'll kind of have my full assessment on one, how long to wait after pregnancy Mm -hmm. and two, do you need a C-section kind of. At right at the time of the, time of the, yeah. the, the surgery of the I, myomectomy. Yeah. I pretty much don't just expect a C-section unless I tell you all that. I mean, I'll talk about it anyways, right? Because sometimes you Set get in and it's like such a superficial fibroid that you're like, no, okay, just this go do your thing. It's yeah. a little different than yeah. what we expected on ultrasound. For sure. Um, so My favorite one when they're pedunculated. They're just so little <laughs> simple ones. Pedunculated fibroids, we threw up uh, the, or my little video on that. It's just when they're kind of hanging off by a little stalk like, and they're like a little mushroom growing it's off. It's almost sad like, also because you, you just don't do anything. <laughs> you're just like, oh, well, okay. Well, you're relieving them of that pain. I know, but like that... as a surgeon, it's like, I want it to play. You know? Right, right. We like, wrong, to, but... we like to have our skills at use. And, yeah. And so... Yeah. Good for uh, the patient. Good. Less fun for us. Right. Yeah. Quick, easy surgery. Yeah. Um, those are. Um, so yeah, we talked a lot about myomectomy mm-hmm. and its competitors and how we make this decision and and try and preserve the uterus. Um, um, but uh, yeah. Um, so um, if you want to hear more about the other procedures surrounding this, view our other podcasts and thing, uh, and you should be able to view that on YouTube along with other videos. Uh, but that's the end of today's podcast. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us again. If you have any questions, let us know in the comments section. Um, and then uh, all the content and video of this podcast is uh, meant for educational purposes. None of it is personal medical advice. If you need any of that, see the provider nearest you.